Hey guys, today we have a really, really fun video. This is the first of a series of topical videos that I am doing with the Flute Center of New York. So yes, this video is sponsored by the Flute Center of New York. After we've spent like two years now making reviews, we figured out that there's a couple of things that we want to discuss more in depth. I will keep doing reviews, but we thought we would sprinkle in some topical videos for you guys. I still have a code that you guys can use to purchase flutes through the Flute Center of New York. Here it is, JAF. It will get you the following perks. When you get free domestic shipping within the US, the shipping costs will be charged up front, but it will be refunded back to you once you return the flutes. Two, you get an extended 10 day trial. Usually it's only seven days. Number three, you get an extended 18 month warranty. And number four, you can take up to three instruments out on trial at a time. If you wanna take flutes out on trial, all you have to do is contact the Flute Center of New York via email, phone, give them my code, and then they can take care of things from there. I will put their contact info in the bottom bar below. For those of you who do decide to take flutes out on trial, make sure that you take off all rings and dangly jewelry before you try the flutes or else it can possibly scratch them. Never use the polishing cloth, the cleaning gauze, or the cleaning rod that comes with each new flute because they are not yours yet. The Flute Center of New York also price matches any authorized dealer so you always know you're getting the best bang for your buck. Please make sure you're actually in the market to buy when you are taking flutes out on trial because if you're not, it's not fair to other people who actually want to purchase those flutes. And lastly, a quick note, every flutist plays each flute differently. Like in Harry Potter, just as the wand chooses the wizard, so the flute chooses the flutist. All right, so now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's jump into today's topic. Every flute kind of looks the same until you look more closely and until I start listing out all the specs. So I decided to just like write down a bunch of questions. I have kind of answered these throughout my reviews, but I do know that you guys tend to pick and choose which reviews to watch because of course you're going to watch reviews of the flutes that you're actually interested in. This video will just kind of put all of those little tidbits together so you'll know what all these specs actually mean. All right, so our first question is gold better than silver? Is silver better than silver plated? Is the more expensive metal better than less expensive metal? In my experience, I actually find that the flute world kind of goes through trends. For a time, gold was all the rage. People still want gold flutes, but it's not as crazy as before. The first gold flute I ever tried, I was more trying it for fun, thinking that I would never get a gold flute. But then of course, the flute kind of chose me. So I am currently still paying off a gold flute. Now that I've had two years of experience trying a bunch of flutes from the Flute Center of New York in more depth than I normally would be able to, I realize now that the metal itself reacts differently to different people. You guys might have noticed that my sound kind of wakes up on my flute, whereas all of these silver flutes that I've ever tried, you may notice that my sound is not as alive. You can tell that the flute doesn't really vibe with me. Julian from the Flute Center of New York has some thoughts about the whole metal thing. Let me just read it to you guys because this is really interesting. So he says, gold is not better than silver, though there is a sound difference. And silver is not necessarily better than nickel, though in each of these cases, the cost rises exponentially to upgrade to the more precious metals. They do have different colors though. While most players prefer gold, many top players prefer the sound of silver over gold. So it's not necessarily linear. Platinum is not always better than gold. Yes, there are platinum flutes, by the way. Gold is not always better than silver. Silver is not always better than nickel. There are a lot of factors in determining the quality of the flute. Material is one, but the head joint cut, scale, pads, riser, and lip plate material, etc., also matter. He has a few more tidbits about this, so I'm just gonna keep reading. Famously, Galway became the man with the golden flute, and I think there's a desire by many top players to try and replicate Galway's career, and part of that is playing on a gold flute. There is a difference in density, however, and density does affect the way the flute interacts with your air. The more dense the material, the more subtly the flute can interact with your airstream. So gold is denser than silver, and silver is denser than nickel. So it can appear to players that gold is better because the flute responds more subtly, more easily. But gold is not inherently better than silver. As for what silver plated means, because I decided to ask him that as well, the base metal is usually nickel. Silver plated and nickel silver are the same thing. The nickel is then covered, hence silver plated, with a very thin layer of silver, usually sterling silver. I did used to naively think that the more precious the metal was, the better the flute was, but I have met people who were like, I 
can't make myself sound good on a gold flute. It's silver for me all the way. The next question, is open hole better than closed hole? My family could not afford to upgrade to an open hole B foot flute from my student model So we ended up getting this guy. This guy is a Mateki solid silver flute and I got this used by the way The whole thing is sterling silver. The whole thing is handmade in Japan. The make of this flute is professional level, but all of the keys are closed hole and it's a C foot joint. I always kind of felt like I had to, like whenever I was going to ensembles and stuff like that, that I had to kind of prove to people that this flute was a good flute and that this is not just like a fancy student model. I did actually have the option to customize my current flute to be closed hole instead of open hole, but I like weird modern music. So I like being able to slide off of the holes and like do pitch bends and stuff like that. So if I don't have the holes to do it, I, I can't do it. Anyway, this is what Julian has to say. No, there's nothing substantively better about an open hole flute, though open hole flutes are vastly more popular. That said, open hole flutes do tend to reinforce good hand position, assuming you are covering the holes. That's something that I didn't really think of until I started teaching. And you can bend pitches and create certain multiphonics only with open hole flutes. Again, that is why I got it. There is a thought out there that open hole flutes resonate better, but the physical the physics of sound waves traveling through a tube, which is what a flute is, a tube, would dispute this idea. What matters is the material of the tube and its length, the taper, is it cylindrical or is it conical? Cylindrical meaning that it is the same diameter throughout, conical meaning that it is wider on one end and then on the other end it is narrower. Baroque flutes are conical by the way. Our modern metal flutes are cylindrical. When Theopold, Theobald, Theopold, Theobald, Bem. I am sorry for butchering his name. When he invented the current modern metal flute, one of the like most innovative things was that he turned it from conical to cylindrical. Back to what Julian said. What matters is the material of the tube, its length, the taper, cylindrical or conical, and a few other factors, but the pad closes the tube fully. So open holes do not affect a tube's resonance. Next question. What is the difference between inline G and offset G and is one better than the other? When I started playing the flute, the offset G already became pretty standard. However, I would say maybe 10, 20 years before I started playing, inline G was actually the standard. Offset G, from what I hear from some students, actually would have costed them more instead of an inline G. I've tried inline Gs before and there's no way, one, that I'm even gonna cover the hole if it's open hole. And number two, I can really only reach like the very edge of the key. I have small hands, okay? So like, I, I can't, I can't reach it. Let's see what Julian has to say. The offset G refers to the two keys controlled by the left hand ring finger. They can be in line with all the other keys or they can be offset from the other keys. The vast majority of people will prefer an offset G because most people's ring fingers are shorter than their middle fingers. Look how freaking short mine is. Thus making the offset G more ergonomic. Inline G flutes are considered more traditional, but the original design by Tabled Bem, ah see, had an offset G. Oh, that's interesting. I did not know that. What the heck? I what? I'm learning things every day. Bem licensed his design to the French flute makers Claire Godfrey and Louis Lo, I don't know if I said their name right, who made the inline versions because they looked more elegant. <laughs> I love it. And because they were a bit easier to manufacture. Keep in mind, these were being built in the 1840s and 1850s before electricity. Since inline G flutes were a bit easier to manufacture and they looked more aesthetically pleasing, it became the traditional French model. Hey! But there is absolutely no difference in acoustics or tone or resonance. This preference is solely about the positioning of the left hand ring finger. The only people who should consider an inline G these days are people with large hands. Next question. What is a split E mechanism? Just so you guys know, I personally cannot really tell the difference between a flute that has a split E mechanism and one that does not because I learned to withstand the resistance of the high E so hard that I play that way anyway on a flute that has a split E mechanism. So to me, it feels the same. Now, I do know though that for some people, 
the split E mechanism makes a huge difference. Now, what Julian has to say, a split E mechanism is actually a bit of a misnomer. They should call it a split G mechanism. That is true. This is because the mechanism, whatever you call it, splits the two G keys. There's a rod in there that connects the two of them. On flutes without a split E, both G keys close together no matter what. But on flutes with a split E, the lower G key can close independently from the upper G. This lower G key is closed by a lever connected to the right hand middle finger. And in order for the mechanism to work, the right hand middle finger must be down and the left hand ring finger has to be up. The only note where this is the case is the third octave E. And put simply, the split E mechanism solves an acoustical problem for that one note. Julian did mention that we can dive deeper into this, but it would make for a pretty intensive video. So if you guys want that video, let us know in the comments below. Next question, is B foot joint better than C foot joint? Really the only thing that it does is it lets you play low B. Like that is literally it. Again, the music that I like to play tends to have low Bs pop up fairly frequently, weirdly enough. I've actually heard of quite a few flutists who will actually buy both a C foot and a B foot joint. With a C foot joint, it means that your flute is actually shorter. It's easier to play high notes. There's less resistance because there's less tube that the vibrations have to go through. I have heard of a B foot extender. It's literally an extension that you pop on to the end. Let's see what Julian has to say. He also says, no, it's not better. The only difference aside from the range is the added weight of the B foot. That is true. Interestingly, the C foot is more common in most of Europe. If you don't play the low B often at all, for endurance's sake, getting a C foot might be better for you. This is why we're making this video, okay? It's because all of these specifications are really based on one, your body, and two, what you are doing with the flute. What kind of music do you like to play? What kind of music are you playing often? Then you need to choose a flute that can deliver. Last question. What is the difference between pointed key arms and Y arms? What are they? And is one of them better than the other? We have Y arms here. You may notice that the keys that you put your finger on look exactly the same as the keys that you don't put your fingers on. On my professional flute, I do have pointed key arms. So you can see that the keys where you don't put your finger on, they have a little pointed arm on it. I got pointed key arms because I like the way they look. At the time that I bought this flute, I cared a lot more what people thought of me, to put it real bluntly. So I immediately just chose to have pointed key arms so that my flute would look more professional. All right, so Julian says, the arms refer to the way the key cups attach to the hinge tubes. I am so glad, by the way, that he sent me this stuff because this is like the legit terminology for this. On most student flutes, the keys are attached with Y arms, called so because they look like the letter Y. Pointed arms used to be the sign of a fully handmade flute because of the difficulty in soldering the pointed arm to the key cup. That's interesting. I did not know that. However, it's now much easier and only slightly more expensive to manufacture. So many students and intermediate flutes now have pointed arms. So it is purely an aesthetic difference at this point. Choose the one that you like. And there we have it for today's video. We do plan on making more of these types of videos because there's a lot more specs than what we covered in this video. We hope this video was helpful for you guys. Let us know in the comments below what other things have you wondered about when shopping for a flute, anything to do with specs or the process of trying flutes or anything like that. We would love to know what you guys want to know. Make sure you follow the Flute Center New York on their Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I will put it in the info box below. My last video is playing right here, which I will put a link to up here for you guys. If you like this video, make sure you give me a big thumbs up. Hit subscribe for new videos every Saturday, but actually hit that bell icon too because, you know, YouTube is broken. You can also catch me on my social media, which are listed down below. But otherwise, I will see you guys next week. Bye. I'm going to have to start. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, oh.